hi in this video let's discuss the next set of topics but before we proceed if at all there is any new point or any new addition all those will be updated in the description part of this respected video so whenever you're going through any discussion video just look at the description part time to time okay now coming to the first topic of this video velcodontics so it's also called as PAO periodontally accelerated osteogenic orthodontics so it's not just about uh, focusing on forces being applied to teeth but it also has something to do with the changes in the bone right so we'll go through some of the information given about will Periodontics in the article. So, Wilcodontics, also known as PAOO, Periodontally Accelerated Osteogenic Orthodontics. And this is comparatively a new sub branch which aids in providing an increased net alveolar volume after orthodontic treatment. And it's a combination of selective decortication facilitated orthodontic technique and alveolar augmentation. With this technique, one is no longer at the mercy of pre-existing alveolar volume and teeth can be moved two to three times faster compared to the conventional orthodontic therapy. Conventional treatment can take anywhere, be anywhere between 18 to 24 months but with PAOO the time or the time of treatment is between 3 to 8 months as mentioned in few review articles. And comparing this orthodontic treatment traditional and PAOO traditional orthodontic treatment focuses solely on the forces applied to the teeth whereas PAOO alters the bone in the process as well facilitating faster movement so that's in brief pertaining to Wilcodontics. Now let's move on to the next one J chain as the letter itself signifies J stands for joining so this joining chain is found or present in the structure of IgM and IgA right so we'll look into some literature pertaining to J chain the joining chain is a small polypeptide expressed by mucosal and glandular plasma cells and this, these, uh, in specific, this J chain regulates polymer formation of immunoglobulin A as well as immunoglobulin M. And as you know, immunoglobulin A mostly it's present in the form of dimer, whereas IgM is pentamer. And this J chain incorporation into IgA and IgM bestows or endows these antibodies with several salient features, which we'll discuss elsewhere. So J chain is present in case of IgM and IgA right now coming to uh, the diabetes symptoms in specific changes in urine so if you refer Davidson it's clearly given that urine testing has to be done to evaluate the following parameters glycosuria presence of glucose in urine this could not be solely because of diabetes but also could be because of decreased uh, renal threshold for glucose right so that's a benign condition also in patients who are on several uh, pharmacological drugs or beta lactam antibiotics liver doper salicylates also might exhibit glycosuria so this is not a diagnostic however there can be glycosuria in case of uncontrolled diabetes also there can be ketonuria in diabetic patients but this is also not diagnostic because ketonuria is also found in those who are following keto diet that is high fat and low carbohydrate or those who are on starving right so also in those there can be ketonuria but when you look at the proteins proteinuria right microalbuminuria so these are something which are specific for diabetic individuals especially in case of uh, lack of urinary tract infection so it's clearly stated that microalbuminuria or proteinuria in absence of urinary tract infection is an important indicator of diabetic nephropathy and or increased risk of macrovascular disease so certain changes which are manifested in urine samples because of diabetes mellitus right and also if at all there are any additional points or additional relevant options pertaining to this question do share we'll discuss and as i said i'll update them in the description part of this video now coming to Treatment of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. So as you know, we always think of adrenaline, but we have a protocol for that. We'll go through that protocol, like what to be followed in case of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. It's not just adrenaline, but even other drugs, antihistamines, steroids can also be used. So antihistamines are beneficial in some kind of type 1 reactions like urticaria, rhinitis, swelling of lips, etc. As I discussed previously, even I had this generalized urticaria where 
I had taken Evil, uh, one of the antihistamines. So antihistamines can also be used in mild versions of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions and also in some skin rashes. In case of anaphylactic shock or angioedema of a larynx, angioedema or congestion of respiratory tract the resuscitation council of uk has recommended the following measures put the patient in reclining position administer oxygen at high flow rate and perform cpr if required inject adrenaline 0.5 milligrams which means 0.5 ml in one in thousand solution intramuscular and repeat every 5 to 10 minutes in case the patient doesn't improve or improvement is only temporary. This is one and only life saving measure. Adrenaline should not be injected IV because it can be fatal unless shock is immediately life threatening. If adrenaline is to be injected IV, it should be diluted to 1 is to 10,000 or 1 is to 1 lakh and infused slowly with constant monitoring. And also administering H1 antihistaminic like chlorpheniram in 10 to 20 milligrams IM or slow IV. It may also have some adjuvant value. Intravenous glucocorticoids, hydrocortisone, sodium succinate, 100 to 200 milligrams should be added in severe or recurrent cases. It acts slowly but is especially valuable for prolonged reactions and in case of asthmatic. So this is the management protocol given by the Resuscitation Council of UK. Fine. Now, often we have several questions from tests of significance. Uh, biostatistics and we have discussed in detail regarding t-test parametric non-parametric and how to differentiate whether it's a chi-square test or student t-test in our classes in detail so when we are trying to compare means between more than two groups or populations then we have something called as ANOVA analysis of variance so I'll go through some literature analysis of variance or ANOVA it's a parametric statistical technique used to compare data sets this technique was invented by Fisher hence it's called as Fisher's ANOVA it is similar in application to techniques such as t-test or z-test in that it is used to compare means and relative variance between them however analysis of variance is best applied where more than two populations or samples are meant to be compared this is very very important right now coming to management of acute asthma, I will present you with a table where you can see a protocol like what drugs to be given and what not to be done in managing the case of acute asthma. You can see in last uh, but fourth or fifth point you can see intravenous administration of aminophilin is not recommended during the first four hours of treatment. right? because of low safety margin and various other reasons so that's very important and also as you can see in several points mentioned here oxygen should be administered in order to maintain oxygen saturation at 92 percent or more than 92 percent up to 98 percent also bronchodilators should be administered by inhalation and combined use of short acting anticholinergic and beta 2 adrenergic bronchodilators is recommended for patients with moderate to severe acute asthma so you can go through this entire table wherein you can find various key messages for treatment of acute asthma right so oxygen is used and however you can just make a note that intravenous administration of aminophilin is not recommended during the first four hours of treatment right also they're given why or according to which kind of recommendations this point is mentioned and patients whose acute asthma is not responding to appropriate therapy, they should be reviewed for adequacy of current therapy and for conditions that may mimic or complicate asthma. Right? So just go, go through that table and get back for any further queries. Now coming to the structure or the nature of streptococcus pneumoniae. So streptococcus pneumoniae, as you can see in the image, they are lancet shaped blade with double uh, edged uh, working area so it's lancet shaped gram positive facultative anaerobic bacteria usually found in pairs diplococci and they do not form spores and they are non-motile so the characteristics physical or growth characteristics of any microorganism are very important we need to make a note of them and we need to memorize them right and observing images to some extent helps us to reinforce those concepts in our memory right so 
Streptococcus pneumoniae. They are lancet shaped gram positive facultative anaerobic um, bacteria usually found in pairs. Diplococci. They do not form spores and they are non motile. Now coming to type 1 GICC, we have GIC classification based on clinical applications. So type 1 is for luting cements, type 2 is for restorations, type 3 liners and bases, type 4 fissure sealants, type 5 orthodontic cement, type 6 is core buildup, type 7 fluoride releasing, type 8 ART, a traumatic restorative technique and type 9 GIC for deciduous stage. So various types of GIC is based on the clinical application. Now coming to the penultimate topic trapdoor technique. So you've seen what trapdoor fracture is. So what is this trapdoor technique? So Edel has given this trapdoor technique wherein we use vertical incisions. It's mainly used for harvesting concrete tissue grafts. So as you can see Edel was the first to describe the trapdoor technique to harvest subepithelial concrete tissue graft from the palate. And in the image you can clearly see how this trapdoor technique is being incorporated by using one horizontal and two vertical incisions and then undermining the tissue and then harvesting the graft. So trapdoor is nothing but a kind of system where you have a hinge as you can see in the image. So this flap resembles that of trapdoor hence it's called as trapdoor technique. So you can see a connected tissue graft harvested from pallet using a trapdoor technique utilizing a horizontal incision 3 to 4 mm away from the gingival margin with two vertical incisions on either side of the first incision creating a door. The door is then undermined and opened using a sharp dissection and the underlying connective tissue is then harvested using a periosteal elevator and the door is sutured away. So it resembles the shape of this trapdoor, hence called as trapdoor technique used for harvesting connective tissue graft from the palate. Now coming to the final uh, topic of this video, self-harming uh, in which kind of syndrome. So what I found is like as we discussed in uh, previous study club discussions as well. So I'm not sure of the options but leash nyhan syndrome is one where you have this self-injurious or self-mutilating behavior. So Leish-Nyhan syndrome is a rare inherited disorder, X-linked recessive disease because of deficiency of the enzyme HPRT. So HPRT stands for hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, right? So because of which there is buildup of uric acid in all the body fluids and leading to symptoms of severe gout, poor muscular control and moderate retardation which appears in the first year of life and the striking feature of leash nyhan syndrome is self mutilating behaviors characterized by lip and finger biting that begin in the second year of life abnormally high uric acid levels can cause sodium urate crystals to form in joints kidneys cns and other tissues of the body leading to gout like swelling in the joints and severe kidney problems and because of lack of the enzyme hprt there can be even poor utilization of b12 vitamin b12 leading to even manifestation of megaloblastic anemia right so these are some of the topics which i wanted to highlight in this specific video and we'll try to do other topics in as many videos as possible as soon as possible. I hope it's clear.